Today I'm speaking with Nicole Hassoun, a professor in the Department of Philosophy at Brighampton University and the project head at the Global Health Impact Project. We discuss her paper, Sufficiency and the Minimally Good Life. I start off with rather broad brushstrokes in ethical theory, but Nicole brings the conversation to a focus and talks specifically about what we, as a society, owe others in our local and global communities. The topic is a large one, and this only touches the surface of her thoughts, research, and humanitarian perspectives. I bring you Professor Nicole Hassoun. Welcome, Nicole, to the show. I'm really happy to have you here, and uh, you know, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Thanks for having me. Right on, right on. So today we're going to be talking about your paper, uh, Sufficiency and the Minimally Good Life. Uh, yeah. When did you write that paper? It just got published. Um, I I got a Tumbleton grant to do that a couple of years ago, and then um, just kept working on it. I'm actually writing a book on the minimally good life. So, yeah. oh, really exciting! Really exciting. Um, I also noticed that uh, Aeon picked it up. Uh, yeah, so I think Aeon asked me to write on the minimally good life as well, and I have another paper that's coming out in the Australasian Journal of Philosophy that. Kind of, this is kind of chapter one, chapter two of hopefully the new book that'll be done this year. Wow, exciting, exciting. Well, yeah, let's jump right into ethical systems. And I, I jotted down a few notes, and I, uh, I, I think it's uh, worthwhile to to spend some time on on some various different ethical frameworks. And so, I'm going to throw a couple ethical systems your way, uh, and I'll, I'll break it down into four categories. And I'm thinking about the virtue ethics of the uh, the Western tradition, probably anchored in ancient Greek, um, deontological ethics from uh, Immanuel Kant, uh, John Stuart Mill and his utilitarian tradition, and then uh, Locke's sympathy ethics. So, um, where where are you as a philosopher, and 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 how would you describe this paper in terms of um, uh, the influences on, on the ethical framework based on those traditions? Wow, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So, you know, the the, the paper is um, fitting into debates in ethics that are pretty contemporary about um, justice in particular and what do we owe people. So kind of as a basic minimum, and I tend to think of, uh, I, I'm more of like a political philosopher than an ethicist. So I tend to think of this as like, well, how would we like choose, how would we set a, a welfare state, you know, level? How What's enough for people? Um, and, you know, the ethics, is connected with this because deep, different ethicists have different theories and, and contemporary views are like, well, kind of utilitarian view um, that we should maximize the good for everybody. And, and there isn't really a basic minimum at all. We just do as much as good as we can. Um, others think that we should, we should give more priority to the least well off. Right. Um, and, and then, you know, we have to um, help people, uh, who, are, who are the most poor, maybe below some threshold, and yet, you know, it will still matter to help people above. And I'm kind of neutral on that last question, like, how much do we have to do for people who are already living really good lives? Um, this is a view about how do we decide if there's like a basic minimum at all? And so um, I guess from a virtual ethical perspective, you might say, well, we have to help people get there in order to be good persons, right? Or from a deontological perspective, you have to say, well, this is a requirement of justice. Like we have to help people get to that basic minimum. It's a, 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 maybe on a principled approach. And I am not going to uh, have a lot to say about Locke's sympathy approach or how that would fit in there. I have to think about that. But that's, yeah, that's kind of where the paper fits in. Well, that's very interesting because I, I, I somehow had some associations with Darwell's, uh, you know, sympathetic concerns, right? And I know you can talk about that because you do in your paper. And I wasn't able to, uh, I think, lucidly draw uh, anything, uh, I guess, really salient back to John Locke's sympathy ethics. But why don't we for a minute talk about uh, about Darwell and... Uh, and his and his approach, and you know where where you align and where you differ. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I just don't know that much about Locke's ethics. Like, I'm more familiar with his political philosophy, so maybe you can draw those connections out for me. But Darwell wrote a book um, that was pretty interesting, um, thinking about how we should sympathize with others a little bit. How do we think about what people need to flourish to, to live almost good lives, but what's good for people? And I'm, I'm consider, considering a slightly different question. So I think what we probably owe people as a basic minimum is at least the ability to or probably actually, actually protections of uh, their living uh, a good enough life. Uh, but what's good for a person uh, might be slightly different than what they need to live a minimally good life because there are those kind of virtue requirements or those parts of living a good enough life where you might sacrifice some of your own welfare to help other people, for instance. And so um, I talk about Darwell in the context of thinking about how do we how do we think about what a good enough life is for other people? Can we put ourselves in other people's shoes as reasonable, caring, you know, free people who are, are asking ourselves the question, well, you know, if I were that person, like what what would the life be like? You know, is that a life, you know, I now would be content to live as that other person. So once we figure out what their life is like, both for them and in general, then we can we can say, well, there's some serious reasons to doubt that that person can live well enough in their context, given their history and psychology and circumstances and so forth. And then that would not qualify as, you know, a minimally good or good enough life on my theory. Um, Darwell's, because he's not focused on sort of the, the whole evaluation of a life but just what welfare is focuses uh, has a different kind of conception of sympathy and how we should think about you know the quality i guess of others welfare or something than than i do in thinking about how should think about other people's lives so it's a very fine difference but yeah yeah um the next piece is um it's a it's a monster of a not so much of a question but it had some things that um i think had the the light motif or the undercurrent of, of a concern from my standpoint. And, and so bear with me as, uh, as, as, as the student in this, in this particular uh, framing here. So the most salient question that I had for your paper um, really related to rapidly changing conditions. And so um, let's speak about it from uh, a perspective that we both can understand. So, um, yourself and myself. Um, I'm I'm part of the middle class to maybe a little bit higher. Um, uh, you are a, a, a PhD philosopher and academic with many, many, and congratulations, lots of, of published papers. So you're a fairly, uh, I guess, prominent um, uh, academic. So in, in terms of a worldwide framework, we're very privileged, I would say. Um, and and that's a very loaded word in terms of the political discourse right now, but say fortunate, okay? Um, now, the, the question comes from this angle. Um, one of the things that COVID has, this pandemic has, has, um, has told, or has uh, basically, uh, illuminated for me is that lives can change dramatically quickly. Um, and if we have social policy that work in a way to give, um, uh, you know, kind of follow that, 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 that mantra that you're talking about, the free, reasonable and caring person would do such and such. Um, I'm wondering if your, if your system and your approach is robust and equi quick enough and efficient enough to adapt to people who, who um, are, 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 you know, may receive very rapid changes in their, in their, um, in their lifestyles. Yeah, I mean, so this isn't, uh, I mean, the way you're thinking about it is sort of an ethical rule about personal behavior. And this is not kind of what I'm after. Uh, so I'm thinking about, you know, think about it as a policymaker and you're trying to figure out, is this social safety net okay? Like COVID revealed all these problems, right? For all different kinds of people, both, you know, in rich countries and in poor countries about like, were these safety nets adequate? People, I mean, we're happy to get the res the, the support, uh, but if you get even a couple thousand dollars, you know, it's not enough when you've lost your job to pay for 
you know, the child care and the other things, the food and so forth you need. And so there's this question of like, are, what do we owe people, right? Is that, is that enough? Should it have been done that way? And I think the answer is probably no. And the reason it's not enough is because it didn't help protect people's ability to live minimally good lives. In some cases, it gave money to people like me, right? Like I qualified and I'm like, okay, I, I don't think I should have gotten that. Um, whereas other people who are desperate and and going to the food bank and whatever in our country even who are globally incredibly well off you know their ability to live minimally well was really on the line and that kind of support in our typical unemployment insurance and so forth isn't nearly sufficient um, to protect people in this kind of who are you know these kinds of vulnerable situations so i think focusing on why you know why we owe people what we owe them um, as a basic minimum in the society and possibly internationally um, can clarify hopefully the obligations we have to them for policymakers and other people potentially even in their personal lives. So if you're looking at this person who's, you know, they're dr- yeah, drunk and they're, you know, they're having problems, maybe they're a kid uh, and, and you're thinking, well, how should I help this person? Well, what do they need to live well enough? Like, whoa, given who they are and their circumstances and a lot of information about them, can you put yourself in their shoes and think, you know, they think they need this, but I, you know, I wouldn't, if I had to be that person, like, I'm not content to live that life. That's not really what they need. Uh, they need maybe, you know, uh, good addiction counseling or something, right? Not more alcohol um, or whatever it is. So I think this is supposed to be a tool that's used for, for us to put ourselves in other people's shoes and think about our obligations to them. What is, what is enough, right? What is it at least a, a good enough life for another person where we can then figure out, well, how can we support their ability to live that kind of life? That's a great explanation. And I, I really help. I really, I really appreciate you helping me through that because it was, I, I think that there's a lot in this, in this essay um, and this paper. And uh, I, I think that our, uh, our traditions, our political and our theoretical uh, traditions actually pull us in in various different currents and so it's just it's really good to have you um explain it and uh and uh yeah so i, I do i do appreciate that and I'm, I'm so impressed with this um i think it's section five of your introduction that says free reasonable and caring people <laughs> so it's like the mantra that keeps repeating itself over and over again. You know, are you free, reasonable, and caring person, right? And I like this idea of not being tethered from coercion or constraint, right? So um, I think that's a really important piece that actually moves um, uh, public policy away from political agendas and it, it, it almost adds a, the ideal of the academic into public policy. Is that, <clears throat> would that be a, a fair comparison to stay objective? Yeah, well, that's very interesting. Uh, I hadn't thought of it that way. So, you know, the idea that you have to be free, I think that's, I think, so philosophers, they like reason a lot, right? Like they talk a lot about how you have to be reasonable and, you know, treat others impartially and all those things, which I think, you know, is a wise, is wise in general, but then the caring aspect sometimes gets left out or people think it's not important. And I think being able to empathize with others is really, really important. Um, And that's how we're able to judge, you know, other people's situations and and figure out what, what we owe to them, what what they need. Um, And then this idea about being free, I think, you know, the, the worry about some theories of welfare, for instance, like what people need is that, um, well, you know, people can be deluded, they can be mistaken, a woman might be abused, and she might just want to stay with her abuser, right? So she has what philosophers call an adaptive preference, like, she wouldn't if she had better options, presumably. And so I think the idea of like, well, you have to be free from a lot of the constraints of that person's life to make this judgment is probably also important like if you were in that situation and you knew that if you left your partner that you probably well you definitely wouldn't be able to afford to send your kids to college you might not even be able to afford a house because maybe you don't have an education right and you can't get a decent paying job and you've got three kids and what are you going to do for childcare? and you just start thinking about 
the reasons people make the decisions that they do uh, come from the constraints of their circumstances and the fact that they're sometimes coerced or manipulated or otherwise have bad options. And so if, you, if, you're, if you're free from that, right, then you're in a position where you can make a good judgment um, or a better judgment is the thought. So sometimes we need an external perspective. Yeah, I think there's some, um, <clears throat> I guess there's uh, there's some dogma in society that comes from both sides of the political aisle that is anchored in a libertarian kind of, uh, I, mean, I was going to say common sense, but it, it is, it's, it's, it's common sense that has, has flavors of dogma to it. Um, and it's definitely not an Ayn Randian, 100% um, uh, libertarian view, but, you know, if there's, there's 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 people in society that say, hey, I I I sacrificed, I um, I I worked towards a goal and I achieved that goal, and I don't think we should be, uh, you know, giving handouts to people or they have to earn it, they have to work, they have to accept responsibility, and they have to like, and it it it's um it's infiltrated into the into our culture this 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 concept of you know not giving something to somebody for free right sure. so what do you think about like that's that's a that's a barrier to break down um, yeah i don't think it's entirely wrong right so you know teach a man to fish right or give them a fish well they probably want a job right like they don't want to just eat for one meal and so setting up social institutions that help people be productive members of society and get what they're due and be able to contribute in ways so that they can be owed things, I think is important. And we can recognize, you know, personal responsibility in this to some degree. At the same time, you know, someone who's stupid, <laughs> who's like, the but, you know, rides a motorcycle without a helmet and has an accident. I don't think that means, you know, that we should neglect them and let them bleed to death on the road, right? So. Mm -hmm. Even though they acted irresponsibly, they might still need emergency medical care. And then, of course, you can charge them for it later if they can afford to pay and, and you know, expect them to, to pay back some of those costs. But you, you have to have reasonable expectations of people. And what it requires of us to help each other is something that matters, right? And it, I think, reasonably informs your view of what a good life is. So, like, if you fail to care that other people have to provide this for you, um, your view of the minimally good life is kind of, you know, tw twisted, right? Like, it should matter to you. And and so when we're, you know, from that external caring perspective, we understand the cost to others and adjust our expectations accordingly, both uh, those of us who must give and hopefully those who get, get stuff as well. And I think that's, you know, um, that's the kind of relationship we should want to stand into each other as, like, co-citizens or members of a global community. Yeah, nicely said. So I wanted to maybe move over to um, George Share, and uh, I think that's how you pronounce his yeah. last name. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So uh, a little bit of a story here that might um, uh, appropriately set the the the, the framing here. Um, I was involved in a uh, a philosophical discussion in in in, in downtown Vancouver, on the Pacific coast of, of Canada, and. Um, it, the topic in this philosopher cafe was about homelessness. And so we got about 45 minutes into a, a two hour conversation. And then um, finally we asked, I, I, I had put up my hand and I said, well, you know, this, this fellow over here hasn't, hasn't had an opportunity to say anything. And as it turned out, this fellow was actually homeless. And so you had the majority of the room <laughs> talking about how to solve homelessness. And he, you know, he actually really appreciated the, you know, the opportunity to explain his perspective. But the irony of the whole conversation was that he actually had to go <laughs> prematurely, uh, you know, before the meeting actually ended. And uh, the reason was, is because if he, if he didn't leave and meet his curfew, he would have lost his bed for the evening. And, you know, that, that really stuck with me because we had... Uh, reasonable people all talking about how to solve the problem when in fact really the person that we really really should have been listening to was you know right there right within our community and uh, and and 
he didn't really have the opportunity to voice his, his opinion. And I, and, and maybe this is why I made the correlation of, of, of George Scher advocating, you know, for more autonomy and self-determination. Is that, would that be appropriate to point? To yeah, so I'm not sure exactly why you invoke Scher there, but let's just talk about your case and then we can talk about Scher. So I think you're absolutely right. Like this person has information that most people don't have, right? Even, you know, I volunteered in a homeless shelter for a while. And so I have some understanding of the fact that, for instance, probably a third of the homeless are mentally ill, right? Most people probably don't, don't know that. Uh, and, and getting that information, understanding what it's like, right? Why people act in ways that seem really, from you know, a very privileged perspective, super counterproductive. Like, why didn't you stay there and you know, get the handout from the, the food bank or whatever, but maybe the guy had, you know, curfew, right? Like he couldn't do it, uh, is really important. So to make these judgments, you need to have that relevant information and that will come from either experience or from talking to people who have been in those situations. And so one of the things I talk about is how we need discussion and deliberation and debate. And we need that kinds of, that kind of information. Um, to touch on George Share though, Share thinks like all we have to do is help people cope with contingency. And so we get them to the level at which they can start to improve their lives, right? Um, and they, he recognizes that for some people, improving your life prospects, like is super easy, right? If you've got a bunch of money in the bank, you can do all kinds of things, right? You can invest in things, you can uh, open a business, right? You can improve your lives in a lot of different ways. But when you don't have anything at all, it can be difficult, right? And even if you get a little bit, right? Just enough to start improving your life, like an education, but no resources or something. Um, then he's going to be like, that's all we owe people. And I think that's not the case, right? So some people simply don't have the mental and cognitive capacities but to do that. And I think we owe those people some things, right? Like we can't just say, well, you know, okay, they can't cope with contingency. So, so what, right? What then? Uh, but then, even people who can get to that point on this threshold where they can start to improve their lives, I don't, I don't think that's enough. Like, I don't think that, you know, that's it. So, for me, what we need to live a minimally good life is a lot of things, right? Like, we we need decent relationships in many cases. We need worthwhile activities. We need, uh, and all the things that contribute to the quality of our life require, you know things like education and food and shelter and so forth. And so somebody who only has like one squeaky and very difficult path out of extreme poverty is not necessarily living what I would call a minimally good life. It's not a life that a reasonable free caring person would be content to live because maybe it's, you know, highly insecure. Like you can think of a person who's living in a garbage dump, right? Who happens to have like access to an education because some NGO is providing it for free and they aren't currently sick, right? I even think your life should be secure, right? Like your access to what you need should be secure. Otherwise your life doesn't qualify as, as good enough. Like people haven't provided you um, with enough. So there has to be no serious reasons to doubt that the life can be well lived. That's the standard. You know, like, can I, can I say that of this person? And I think that there are very serious reasons to doubt people who are living just like above the poverty line and could go to community college and so forth to improve their lives can live well enough or do live well enough in many cases because, you know, it just takes one truck, right, to hit you. And then all of a sudden, you know, you have serious medical issues, you have no health insurance, you have no job, right, and you can't go to community college. And that's, that's not enough. That's not good. Yeah. I tend to believe uh, – uh, I, I believe in people. I really do. I think that people um, have a lot of potential, uh, you know, to offer. And uh, I've I've said openly that um, I'm all for incentive and markets. Uh, I, I really am. But I think incentive shouldn't be around, uh, you know, being hungry. I you know I've said, so I've, been, I've, I've said that type of thing. So from a libertarian approach, I know the answer. I read it in your paper. Um, uh, but maybe you could explain the role for uh, uh, when it switches over into more of a, a libertarian, um, uh, you know, market-driven activity. Um, would would you explain kind of how you approach um, the value of a libertarian tradition? Yeah, so it's interesting. My first book talks a lot about libertarianism and why I think that even from a libertarian perspective, we owe people a basic minimum. 
Um, and that has to do with the fact that it's important for people to have choices. They should be able to object and consent to course of rules, like the, the system that they're subject to. And in order to do that, in some cases, they, they're going to need support that they're not otherwise going to get. And so for the, the course of rules to be legitimate, people have to have that kind of freedom under them, which requires things like food and water and shelter. So I think you can bring libertarians on board, or at least that they should agree to some of this. But that's, I think autonomy is not enough, again, to live a minimally good life. It's not, it's not okay. They just have like one set of decent options. Uh, and so the libertarian, I mean, the libertarian generally doesn't agree with that kind of analysis. They don't think we owe people any basic minimum. They think markets are somehow, it, maybe some of them think that it, markets will magically provide everything people need. But when it comes to, you know, things like food, water, shelter, they clearly have it. I mean, some years ago, half the world was living on what $2 a day buys in the U.S. And it's still a great portion of the population is living in absolutely desperate poverty there aren't the charity organizations that are solving that problem i think slowly it's getting better and markets have a huge role to play in that so i don't want to either you know uh, say i don't like markets or anything but i think that there's market failures there's times when people are too sick you know if you, if you do get hit by that truck right you can't necessarily get what you need unless you know there's some institutions that are going to support you in that endeavor and i think we need to shore up our social safety net so you yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, contrasting our two uh, countries, um, Canada has, you know, more of, I would say a little bit more of a social safety net, I guess, maybe on the surface, there's people that, that critique that, but, you know, there is a, a little bit more of an acceptance on, on, uh, on, on the socialism, uh, as opposed to it being such a, um, uh, an abrasive word for, for, for many Americans. Um, but um, I'm here to say that you know we're not we're not under uh, oppressive rule, and you know we're not we're not maybe like Cuba is in the news. That's an interesting thing right now that's happening. Um, I'm not. I didn't bring up Cuba so we could talk about it. But um, I actually wanted to just say that we have about ten minutes left, and I thought where I would actually take this is your example, the second of three examples. Um, uh, and this one was in particular about an Amish girl, and it, and you describe it as um, the 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 girl is um, looking to get outside of her community in some respects for p personal uh, growth and development. And so, um, in in reading that example, I wasn't entirely sure where um, where your recommendation would be or how you would approach it or what your, what your opinions were on this. Could you elaborate on that instance of the, of the Amish girl in her community? Yeah. I mean, I took it to be a kind of hard case. So, you know, there's these rules where, um, children can leave the community as long as they don't pledge to stay. And then if they pledge to stay, they'll be ostracized, right? They won't be allowed back if, um, if they then decide to leave. And so, you know, you take a woman who's, uh, kind of wants to leave, but maybe she's already pledged to stay. And so she's making this terrible, difficult choice between, you know, staying and being a part of her community, but not getting to go to college, not getting to do the things in her life that maybe she wants to do. And and the thought was, you know, what does this person need to live a mentally good life? So, you know, being reasonable, caring and free, I think we need a lot more information about like what's that gonna be like. But when I try to put myself in her shoes and you know, just thinking about someone who might be like super attached to their family, right? And where that kind of loss and that ostracism is going to, they can carry them throughout their whole life, right? Like they're not going to have sort of the support they need necessarily to, to achieve their life prospect, you know, goals. Like they may not have money for college. Maybe they can get a scholarship. It's going to be very difficult, right? They're not, if they have kids, are they going to have any help? Like in the future, will they, you know, feel sad that they made that decision? Um, on the other hand, if they, you know, they stay and not fairly, let's just say traditional, you know, religious context where they're not happy maybe. And, you know, maybe the person is, you know, sacrificing a lot, right? I'm going to stay here. I'm going to start having kids. There's, you know, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a good uh, Amish wife. Like that might not be satisfying for that person either. So if you think about that person and suppose my description seems, accurate of the person once you know who that is then you know it may be that there's very little that you can do to help the person live a minimally good life like even if you provide the college education the prospect should she decide to leave that might help right that might help and then that is all i say like well if if that's you know the case then maybe that 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 there should be that kind of support for her but 
within that within the community, I don't know what you could do to make it better. Like it, it would evolve, affecting a lot of other people's lives. So I, I guess I just ended up saying, yeah, that's a really hard case. Like, how do you, how do you, what, what would do it? And there, I guess you would start with the discussion of the deliberation, right? Like, it would talk to people in the Amish community, because uh, I guess before meeting the Amish, I had thought like, oh yeah, of course I would help a young woman leave her community. But when I went to visit an Amish farm and met such a person, I was like, wow, that's a, that's a really big thing to step into, <laughs> like, affecting a person's basic life prospects in that way. And the way yeah. offered the resources, so it wasn't something that I felt like I had good handle. Yeah, I'm reminded of something 20 years in hindsight, in like 20 years into the future in hindsight, looking that we are viewing um, culture through our, you know, cherished liberal democracies and realize that um, hindsight may show us that, you know, we, we, we shouldn't pull them away from communities. We've seen, um, and I don't know if it's a comparable example, but there's, there's instances where we, we pull people out of their communities and try and support them, um, either with, um, you know, it, uh, uh, I guess, uh, ulterior motives and definitely not what you're talking about against coercion and constraint. But um, if we, if we look in hindsight in 20 years and say, well, maybe that wasn't the best, uh, you know, our opti- uh, the best approach to give, um, you know, this young girl a, um, you know, the best life. Um, I think in, in my opinion, I'd say, you know, working with the Amish community to, you know, to shed some life on the community as a whole, um, I, I think that that the values um, reforming some of the values from within wouldn't alienate her her community, right? I think that's um, I think yeah. that would be important from a holistic approach, right? Yeah, I mean, it might be possible. I really don't know. So I think that the the first step in really thinking about the question would probably actually be we'll talk to people both who have left and who have stayed, right, and and to the community and to to the look take a look around at the programs that you know, people have created to address this kind of issue because there are definitely people who work on it and know a lot more. So, you know, sometimes we just kind of can't put ourselves in that situation mm-hmm. or we're not sure that we understand. You know, you'd have to know a lot about that particular individual and her community and what the options would be for her outside of her community and what the options for changing it would be and so on. Um, you know, how realistic they are. Other cases, I think it's, you know, pretty clear. So I gave this example from South Africa, and I'm like, could you live a minimally good life in, in, in that kind of, um, you know, shanty town situation? And I'm like, oh, I think there's some serious reasons to doubt that, you know, the person is likely to get an education and a job to support the family and things that most people, and maybe the person are, you know, evaluating might want to do. So I think, yeah, I think it's really, it requires a lot of information for that particular person, that particular circumstance, their psychology, their history to make that kind of judgment. And one of the things I, I, I want to do is provide an account that's sufficient, like sufficiently attentive to differences between individuals because, you know, providing people what most people need won't work, right? If you're not like most people. So if you have, you know, you're in a wheelchair and everyone makes, you know, you know town without any curb cuts, like that's not going to be attentive enough. To, to the needs of, of, of disabled people, for instance. So I think, you know, uh, that's why we have to kind of consider it on a case by case basis. Absolutely. Well, okay. So Nicole, I think that's a really good kind of summary. Unless there's something else, especially related to this particular paper, that you wanted to say. Any closing remarks about the paper, or or any directions you'd like to uh, to, to send listeners uh, if they want to learn more. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, watch out for the book. I think one thing to think about is, you know, how do we think about men of legal lives and what's that require for people in, like, future generations? How does this affect, like, the environment, environmental sustainability? Because, you know, although I want to just make the case that we should help people live men of good lives, there's a question about how much more we can demand, too, right, for ourselves and uh, how much we owe to people in order to do that and, you know, what's going to be sustainable in helping people live minimally well into the future. So. That's something I'm thinking about as well. Well, thank you. That was, uh, for me, it was a very enjoyable conversation. And uh, I you know, hope you enjoyed yourself. And, uh, you know, thank you for spending some time with us. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, too.